come to the most instructive and enlightening workshop of the week, uh, and I'm delighted to have been asked to chair it. Thank you for turning up. It's, a, it's a, one of those rooms where you feel it's a best kept secret uh, as to how to get in here. So first of all, your initiative in, a, in arriving here is, is to be applauded, and I'm very grateful to you. Uh, it is also the only room in which four uh, members of the United Kingdom Parliament have convened at this conference altogether, all together, all on the same platform. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that four of us have come from the UK Parliament because it underlines the importance of the Intergovernmental Forum, for, uh, Governance Forum for uh, the UK and the initiative that we're taking to support it. Uh, like uh, others at this conference, uh, we obviously uh, recognize the outrage in Mumbai and send our supportive best wishes to the people of India. But uh, I think on behalf of my colleagues, I'd just like to add one point for the record, which is that the terrorists are trying to undermine government by consent. And in the process, of course, are using some of the opportunities of uh, new technologies and the internet for their dastardly deeds. Uh, but if they were ever successful, they would shut off the communications to people. In other words, they are ex explicitly trying to undermine the principles which underpin the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, and in particular, judging by some of the early evidence, they are terrorists who would certainly shut off communications and probably education to the women in the world where they were, uh, were they ever able to get dominance. So, um, we can send a double message to the people of India, first of all, of sympathy, and, and secondly, recognition that these terrorists are actually trying to undermine the principles of the Internet Governance Forum, which is meeting here in India. Uh, what we've tried to do in the United Kingdom is look at the positive aspects of the Internet. We recognize that some people are concerned about it. We recognize that its ex expansion and penetration amongst the population might be held back by fears. We don't want that to happen, and therefore we've looked at best practice ways of overcoming some of those difficulties uh, and sharing them amongst ourselves. And the purpose of this seminar is to sp spread more widely the message that it, we can make the internet safer, and we can make the internet much more applicable to people in their everyday and day lives without it being a concern. Uh, and the problems which have emerged and which have been the subject of discussions that have gone on uh, since this forum began to, uh, are ones that we can best perhaps deal with in cooperation with each other. So various groups have come together, nominate uh, the organization, and my first speaker is the legal uh, director of nominate. Uh, has worked with other organizations to show how best practice can be applied and has had, in fact, competitions uh, for different examples of best practice in different categories. But I'm not going to preempt what she has to say. I'm going to ask Emily Taylor if she would like to come forward and present the Nominate Best Practice Challenge uh, and show us how it can be done. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, welcome to those of you who found the room. The title of today's workshop is uh, UK Best Practice Partnership in Action. And the context for the Best Practice Challenge that I'm going to be talking about is a UK IGF process. Uh, I think it was the first national process set up to support the international discussions. And it's a collaboration between Nominet, which is the .uk registry, and government, parliamentarians, many of whom are here today, and private sector and civil society members. So what was the idea behind the Best Practice Challenge? This was the second year that we've run it, and it really built on the success of the, the previous year, and we saw a very high standard of entries. And, uh, we've handed out a booklet which showcases both the winners and runners-up in this competition. 
The Best Practice Challenge has helped us identify examples of British initiatives that have really made a difference. And the idea was through this national UK IGF process to bring new voices to the policy dialogue. And through the Best Practice Challenge, that is done through people's work rather than perhaps their statements. As nominate the, the Internet Registry, we know very well the value of best practice sharing amongst our colleagues, um, some of whom are here today. We all exist in this fast-changing environment where there's really no precedent to guide us in making decisions about issues as they come forward. And when you talk with international colleagues, you realize that we're all facing similar issues and we're all responding to them, reacting to them in different ways. And you can pick and choose from the examples of colleagues and learn from them. And so we have benefited from that and we thought that this would be a good model to support the IGF dialogue. So one of the things that I think is most valuable about the IGF as a process is talking to colleagues from developing countries and realizing and revisiting that tremendous excitement, the thirst to get online, to have access, to really realize the benefits of the internet. Now in Europe, sometimes the policy dialogue is, we lose that sense of excitement, of positivity. We focus on the fears, the fearfulness, the negativity, the challenges. Yes, they exist and uh, there's no denying that. But the best practice challenge, I think, was intended to counterbalance uh, the, the fearfulness and to celebrate both the achievements but also the positive aspects of the internet, such as you know, the 93-year-old granny who's able to keep in touch with her family in Australia by using the internet. So this year, just to highlight the winners, the, the categories broadly mirror the IGF big themes, access. The winner was Edinburgh Age Concern and their project ACE IT, which was an in initiative to train the 50 plus age group in using the internet um, through projects like the Edinburgh Silver Surfers. Moving to security, now phishing and online fraud is something that is a very uh, hot topic in the UK as I'm sure in the rest of the world at the moment. And the um, awards recognized the work of Barclays Bank with their pin sentry device, which is now also rolled out to Turkey and South Africa. And it's successfully addressed the problem of gaining trust and confidence online by issuing unique passwords to support online banking transactions. Now in diversity, the Common Knowledge UK project is an attempt to bridge the digital divide by um, reaching out to people who have significant cognitive learning difficulties and providing them with tools uh, and, and a learning experience which matches their needs. Something that was highlighted, uh, not the project, but the, the digital divide was highlighted in Minister Raja's speech yesterday. With openness, YouthNet's Do It um, or .org uk website encourages and enables young people who want to volunteer and puts them together with projects that might suit them. We had other categories as well which are reflected both in the, in the leaflet you have and in the exhibition which is in the IGF village. But these other categories reflected UK priorities um, and the winners were Get Safe Online, the Internet Watch Foundation for their tremendous work in uh, combating child abuse online, and the British Library, whose, um, whose project brought sacred texts from every religion onto the web. So there was great variety, wonderful quality, a real inspiration for those of us who are lucky enough to work with it. But I really believe that we just scratched the surface this year, that there is much more to be found both in the UK and internationally as examples of best practice. Thank you. That is, sets the scene. Actually, people have been flooding in in the last few minutes, so you missed my opening oration, which um, uh, I'm not going to give again, don't worry. But uh, what I am going to say is that what we're talking about here is the 
UK Intergovernment Forum, which really picks up and mirrors the issues that we're discussing here in Hyderabad. Uh, it attempts to show how in the UK we've taken the inspiration of the IGF and then looked at trying to make the internet positive by showing how collaboratively we can tackle the problem. So we've involved parliamentarians, we've involved government, we've involved the civil society, NGOs, uh, and we've actually brought in the technical people and industry. So this is a collaborative framework. Emily of Nominet has just explained some of the prize winners to the uh, challenge that we had this year, and a brochure's been passed around. If you haven't got it, uh, there are two, and I'm going to flash them. These are essential reading. Um, if you take anything else away from this conference, take away the best challenge practice documents, because it will actually help in each of the countries uh, some of the ideas. Now, uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, second, there are four of us who are British members of Parliament here. We're, we're very keen on the IGF and we want to show the positive aspects that can be dealt with. And Alan Michael, uh, who is one of the members of Parliament who has been most credited with uh, the initial British support for the IGF, uh, Alan is going to talk about e-crime and um, uh, the dis reduction partnership that we've got. And the stress there is on the reduction. In other words, Let's be positive, even if there are, we know that there are problems. And who better to be positive, even though he knows he's got problems, than Alan Michael? Criminal activity on the internet uh, and what is being done by a variety of initiatives to increase security. Uh, but what I want to talk about, uh, as Ian has just explained, uh, is the UK Internet Crime Reduction Partnership. Um, the UK IGF, again, I echo Ian's words, is itself a best practice example by the fact that we are sharing experience and views from governments, business, parliament, and civil society. And that is, has been from the beginning absolutely the essence of the IGF internationally, and it's absolutely of the essence with us too. Um, the uh, fact of the matter is that uh, people are frightened uh, by the term cybercrime, uh, it makes them think, firstly, that it's about the technology, and secondly, because there's exponential growth, they think it's out of control. That isn't the case. It's the use of the internet uh, that is increasing exponentially, and that inevitably leads to cri criminals using uh, the internet. Uh, it's, in fact, not out of proportion to other elements of crime. For instance, shoplifting, retail crime, uh, uh, also has to tolerate a percentage of criminal activity in order to do its business. But the fact you tolerate it doesn't mean that you don't do what you can uh, to prevent and reduce it. Second point I want to make is that uh, it's an offline point, but it applies online as well, and that is that uh, very little of crime is dealt with by law enforcement. Uh, the top level of crime is a matter for police and security services, but the police don't deal with most uh, of lower level crime uh, offline in the real world, and the police will never have the capacity to deal with online crime. So it's a complementary uh, approach that is needed in order to uh, make the internet a safer place, if you like, to prevent and reduce criminal activity and exploitation of the internet. That means that a positive response is uh, vital. When we made our promise uh, at Rio uh, at the IGF last year to establish the UK IGF, we also said that we would bring back this year more examples of good practice and that we would seek to uh, establish uh, a crime reduction partnership. Um, that has been very successful, incidentally, in the real world when it comes to local uh, crime reduction partnerships tackling things like violence uh, and down to lower level issues like litter. The potential is there for us to do that in the online world. The other mistake that we make is to think that because the internet is so global, so fast, that we're too small to do anything about it on our own. One of the uh, really satisfying things in the last year has been along with our steps, and they're very uh, early steps, uh, both the UK IGF itself and the uh, work of the uh, uh, Internet Crime Reduction Partnership 
are at the early stages, a bit like a baby learning to walk, not at a fully uh, developed level. Uh, but we've seen already in regions of the UK the w development of the Wales E-Crime Forum and the Yorkshire E-Crime Business Centre, which indeed was one of the best practice award winners, which is referred to in that leaflet. So again, instead of thinking, we can't do anything, it's too global, uh, it's beyond us, uh, many people are starting in other countries as well, I think Australia's one, uh, to look at what can be done at the national level. And the key then will be to bring from the national level uh, the lessons that are learned, the successes in uh, crime reduction, uh, in order to uh, share that at the IGF and to learn from others. I really do believe uh, that we need the international, the interagency report, we need the technical protection systems, we need police and law enforcement to be doing their thing and sh linking up internationally, but we also need a comprehensive approach to crime reduction at the national and local level if, in particular, we're to deal with the nuisance level of crime. Now, in the panel session that just ended on the main platform, the word that was underlined was trust, uh, the need for trust in cooperation, but also the need to, uh, tr to be able to trust that you go safely onto the internet. I put it the other way, that it's, a, it's, it's an issue of confidence. If we're to have that confidence, we need to protect people from the uh, attacks and the problems which they will feel that they're dealing with on their own in order that people can genuinely uh, feel that the internet is a safe place. Thank you. The lessons I think we want to get across in this session is that the, the way to deal with problems which we do recognize exist on the internet is not just through legislation, <coughs> not just through parliament taking action. Uh, partly because Parliament will probably take the wrong action, and anyway it may be ineffective, but it, certainly in the British Parliament's context it would take so long that the technology will have moved well beyond the legislation we were trying to pass. But just to show that there are more members of Parliament here in Hyderabad from the British Parliament than there would be in the Chamber of the House of Commons on a wet Thursday afternoon, I'm going to introduce another member of Parliament, Margaret Moran. Margaret has pioneered in the House of Commons work on how uh, children can get more access to the internet, but how we might together try to reduce the threats that might then come to them. So, Margaret, thank you very much for coming. Clearly underworked there. And I'm, always, I'm just going to stand over here, because I always have to explain to people that I hate podiums. I think there's a thing called podiumitis. Uh, from the time that I realized that the board here, I didn't say whatever this says, uh, actually said, please do not photograph speakers uh, at the podium, shoot them before they get there. And I always um, take that as my motto. <laughs> try, try not to get killed before you get to the end of your speech. As has been said, um, the world of the internet offers threats and opportunities. And in the dialogue around child abuse online, often we are talking more about the threats and the fear uh, associated with the use of the web. And I just want to make the point very strongly at the outset that the wonderful opportunities that the technology offers children must not be diminished. We must encourage them to use the technology freely. Uh, but of course, we have to build in the protections to ensure that they are uh, aware of the dangers that may be out there in terms of the openness of the web and protect them from potential abusers. The threats are huge, uh, but so are the opportunities. And they range from cyberbullying, uh, videoing of assaults online, the so-called happy slapping or worse, uh, young people threatening each other with knives and guns on, on mice, being videoed and put up on MySpace or YouTube, um, tracking and uh, tracking technologies through mobile phones, sometimes mobile phones being sold to parents or children as if they're protection devices when actually, so you can find out where your child is, but actually which can get into the wrong hands and be used for other predatory purposes. And right the way through to extremely serious abuse, abuse of babies, some of the most horrific, hardcore child abuse, which sadly is increasing. The thing that we realized very early on is that the speed of change of technology is such that we could never hope to legislate to get on top of the issue. 
Uh, and of course, the speed of changes to change is increasing, even as we speak. I mean, today, there was the news that MySpace are now streaming video to phones. Wonderful opportunities, but potential dangers if young children's or babies' images are streamed using mobile phones. Mobile technology means that it isn't the case that parents can have the, the uh, safeguards of looking over the shoulder of their child in the bedroom or wherever the computer is anymore. Everything will be, the, co the wonderful connectivity of the technology now means that those opportunities also become threats in the sense that they are the, the everywhere on, uh, the technology is available, and we can't supervise our children in, that, in the way that we used to think that we could. And that means, too, that there are new levels of vulnerabilities out there. We've heard that, um, for example, India may not have a great uh, penetration of the internet, of the web. However, it has huge numbers of mobile phones. I suspect that con connectivity is going to come very fast. Does that, for example, open up a new market of young, vulnerable children? That's the sort of thing we have to look at. So, as has been said, the speed of technology means that we can't legislate. We have to adopt new methods of dealing with these issues. And so I'm a legislator that doesn't believe in legislation because we simply can't keep up. And very often, when we do legislate, it's not only far too late, but the outcomes may be the perverse ones. We heard an example of Finland where they um, identified those sites which they felt were not appropriate and needed to be uh, ba uh, banned so that people couldn't access them. But of course that means that those sites have been easily identified for predators to go on. So a completely counterproductive outcome. So that's why we, have, we developed fairly early on a multi-stakeholder partnership involving parliamentarians, government, uh, NGOs, and industry, and the whole of the range of the, cr the criminal justice system, and of course, involving parents and children. And uh, that has worked to provide uh, guidance, codes of guidance, in conjunction, in collaboration with industry, because industry knows how their technology is being used best, and how we can build in prevention mechanisms I call it a sort of partnership and prodding approach, which, is, which means uh, that the prodding comes in the form, for instance, I have introduced 10-minute rule bills or private bills, uh, which are intended as levers rather than actual legislation. One was to ensure that all uh, internet service providers gave, demonstrated, so that's transparency and accountability, demonstrated that they use filters to ensure that the worst elements of child abuse images are not accessible to children particularly. We've also introduced legislation which we're currently discussing with industry on age verification online so that young people are not uh, able to access knives and guns and all sorts of other prohibited things online in the same way as they are prohibited in the real world. Now, uh, developing on from this uh, multi-stakeholder partnership, which has been going for a number of years now, uh, the government recognised that this was a good and serious approach. Uh, it introduced something called the Byron Review, which looked at uh, ways in which uh, we could ensure that parents and children were involved in building a strategy to tackle problems around that range of uh, issues like online bu bullying, safer search f features, uh, violent video games. And so it has now kind of adopted our multi-stakeholder uh, forum, uh, and that is now, has now turned into a, uh, a body which is now uh, serviced cross, across government, uh, and it's now the UK Council of Child Internet Safety, of which um, I'm a member. And we're developing a strategy which uh, is to uh, is establish a comprehensive public information and awareness campaign uh, across government and industry and to provide, if you like, a one-stop shop of information so parents don't have to go to loads of websites or search for where they can get advice and support and education resources to keep their children, help keep their children safe. 
uh, to provide specific measures to support vulnerable children and young people, such as taking down illegal internet sites. We work with the Internet Watch Foundation on that. And to promote uh, responsible advertising to children online and establish voluntary codes of practice for user-generated content sites. You'll all be aware of the issues around uh, YouTube and MySpace. Uh, and I have to say, MySpace do look at what content's going up on their sites. There are concerns that YouTube doesn't and only responds when it, they are notified about uh, about breaches in their terms and conditions. So one of the things we have to say in the partnership is that we do need full cooperation of industry. And I ha I'm happy to say that to date that has been reasonably uh, effective. Uh, we are, we're looking at emerging issues and indeed as chair of uh, one of the, the uh, parliamentary IT committees, we're working with the various stakeholders to try and anticipate the emerging outcomes from changing technology. As I said, one of the problems is that technology runs faster than we can, and I think as policymakers, we have to work with industry to identify those areas that we ha may have unintended outcomes which could be harmful for children. So some of the issues that we're looking at at the moment is the fact that we do need the full cooperation of industry to help police what is happening uh, on, in the online world in relation to protecting our children and wherever possible build those protections into the technology. We have to make sure that all the players are at the table. There is currently a concern or confusion I suppose about the mobile sector where the, the, the people that produce the gizmos are pointing to the people that produce the software and content and each are blaming the other where they're saying, no, we're not responsible for some of the content online uh, and we're not coming to the table. We're working on that at the moment. We do need clear and transparent industry standards and we do need to ensure that we have proper age verification. That's just some of the issues that we're dealing with. But returning to the point about the opportunities, the, one of the projects that we're developing, particularly through Urim, is using Blackberries as an alert so that uh, people who are experiencing violence, be they children or families, are able to use the BlackBerry, the massive and wonderful facilities on there for, uh, for an alert for when they are, feel they are in danger, to take pictures and videos and sound as evidential base where there is violence, and also to bring together those uh, agencies in the online world, virtual, uh, multi-agency uh, safety organization forum. At the moment, the, the, those agencies that protect children very often have to meet in the real world to discuss how they will deal with individual cases, which is extremely time confused, consuming and often confusing for those agencies concerned. We're now developing software where that can be done online. And I hope that just helps to illustrate that the technology is both a force for good in protecting our children, as well as a potential threat, which we all have a responsibility to address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moment, uh, because they're working closely with us. Uh, yet another member of parliament, uh, and uh, Andrew Miller actually chairs the Parliamentary Information Technology Committee, and he's been looking at the uh, way that uh, we can bring better use of the internet into schools. And that is another point that we want to sort of get across. It's not just the end user that needs to be reassured. In many cases, it's members of parliament, because those who don't understand the internet will automatically reach for the lever saying, let's ban, let's legislate, let's hold back. Uh, so what uh, Andrew has been doing with others uh, is a very good indicator of how collaborative work can reassure. And uh, Andrew, would you like to address us? At, uh problem that I know is not unique to the UK. Almost every country I've spoken to uh, here at this uh, uh, conference have said yes, they recognise the problem, and that is the lack of engagement by parliamentarians in the world of ICT. It's partly the reflection of the fact that a s very significant number of um, parliamentarians across the world do not come from an engineering or technology background 
and my colleagues uh, on the table who, who, despite the fact they, that they don't come from a, an engineering <coughs> technology background, who they've embraced the challenges of how to use the technology positively for, for, for society, they are <coughs> rare beasts indeed. And we were exa examining how we could um, uh, improve this situation. And we came up with this little idea that uh, one thing that all politicians like anywhere in the world is a photo opportunity. So uh, uh, we devised this little uh, competition that uh, uh, is illustrated in the booklet that's uh, in, in the room here um, that brought together two separate uh, challenges. One, how to uh, engage with more parliamentarians and two, how to celebrate some of the great success stories that are going on at a local level it, within our primary school uh, uh, sector. These are children up to the age of about 11. And there are some stunning projects that I've seen uh, it, during the course of this competition, and indeed I know because I've seen stuff elsewhere throughout the world, uh, just how good some youngsters are. And we really ought to celebrate that good work and uh, help it uh, evolve. So in um, 2007, we invented this uh, competition that was uh, called uh, Made It, it being IT, happen. Uh, we've slightly modified it uh, a, a, a couple of years down the line. Um, the, 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 the competition that's just been launched for 2009 has a, a, has a title, uh, Make It Happy. And uh, again, it's uh, focused at the the, the primary uh, generation. We're supported in our work with our key um, uh, skills uh, agency in the IT sector, eSkills uh, UK, uh, who are a fantastic bunch of dynamic people uh, who uh, really put some superb energy into um, the project. And uh, we're also uh, sponsored in our work by the Institution of uh, Engineering uh, and Technology and the British uh, computer society. I just want to bring to your attention some of the issues that have uh, come up, and you, you can read about this at, at your leisure, but the, just uh, the, the first year when we conducted this, um, the, the diversity of the projects that the youngsters came up with. Um, the first prize you, you'll see was a language-based uh, project. The second prize uh, was a project helping uh, uh, encouraging young children to, to create a DVD working with pensioners. Uh, another bridge to build, the first two about bridge building. Um, the third one was about uh, 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 working with a child, an individual child who was exceptionally talented um, and working in a school that was quite disadvantaged in a suburb of Liverpool. And uh, the, the, the creativity of the school actually shone through and have, uh, helped so many people. And this was about talent um, and helping that talent flourish in a disadvantaged community and bringing forward the standards of all the school. Uh, so those were the first uh, uh, three prizes. Just as, a, as an aside, you know, uh, uh, people from other countries think, oh, well, uh, UK, you're, you're, you're pretty well uh, uh, set. Um, uh, uh, there's no disadvantaged families. Yes, there are. Uh, one of the prize-winning team of children that came down to London had never been out of his home city of Liverpool in his whole life. So coming to Parliament to collect his prize was a, 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 a huge uh, uh, improvement in, in, in his life. We're supported in this work by... Uh, the, the Speaker of the House and the Lord Speaker in the House of Lords, and we intend to uh, continue it. Um, but it's a model that has, uh, first of all, seriously engaged an increasing number of children, but going back to my first message, it's also engaged a significant number of members of Parliament. So I'm, I'm throwing that one out in, in, into the pond as an idea that other people could reflect on but certainly we would welcome back in the spirit of the uh, IGF and the, the, the best practice approach uh, ideas from other people about how they've worked 
to uh, engage their parliamentary assemblies uh, and governments in uh, the face-to-face uh, -face work in, in, in this area. It is a challenge, uh, but it's a challenge that uh, has solutions as well. Thanks very much. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we're looking forward to participation on the floor in a few minutes. Uh, we are open to ideas. What we're effectively saying is this is what we've tried to do in the United Kingdom to take forward the principles of the Internet Governance, for Governance Forum. What else could we be doing? Uh, so these are our best practice ideas. What are the ones that we could be adopting? But just to underline the close working relationship we have with industry, we have uh, Mr. Industry himself, the um, representative of the Confederation of British Industries, which is a wide-ranging group of uh, important players who work not only, obviously, in a commercial context, but many of them do a great deal of corporate social responsibility work within their communities. Dr. Jeremy Beale is going to address us on some of the security issues and openness issues which his companies deal with. Emily talked about Nominate's best practice awards, but I'm actually going to talk about Nominate as an example of best practice and how this is, can be, a, ex, the national registry that Nominate is can be of extreme value um, to the business community and how that might actually be adopted as a sort of model of best practice in their own fashion by other countries. Um, just by way of sort of introduction, I am uh, a member of uh, Nominate's policy advisory body, um, which is a grouping of both their members um, and broad stakeholder representatives, with myself as being a representative of British business. And this is a body that deals usually with very technical issues of policy, working out the stance that Nominate should take. Um, the people on it are very technically literate, or the members are. Some of the stakeholder uh, people are less literate, but that does establish a dialogue between sort of broader communities um, and that have an interest in the domain name system and those people that are actually dealing with it, which is useful, um, at times challenging. But the PAB can also address, at times, quite strategic issues of the day and ones that this um, Internet Governance Forum have been discussing this morning. And I will illustrate this by a meeting we recently had around phishing um, between the, the PAB and the, um, the banking industry body, APAX, which represents the uh, banks in terms of payment systems. This was a mutually beneficial meeting, but also was focused in a very specific way. And if I can put that in context to show its importance briefly, it is this, that as I think probably many people here know, um, the development in phishing and in e-crime in general is increasingly away from sort of general attacks and more and more targeted. The criminals, in other words, are getting more and more sophisticated. And when they fish and do identity management, they do it through much more sophisticated means. So people fall for the attack much more easily by it being much more tailored towards them. The banks are increasingly finding that this is a growing expense to them um, and is undermining their business models and their, also their good reputation with their customers um, and more widely. And of course, in the UK at the moment, that is of extreme importance to them, given the other pressures that they face. So they've been very interested in starting a dialogue, and this is what this meeting was the start of, with registrars and ISPs about how they can identify fishers and then cut them off. Now that of course is quite a challenging um, issue for the ISPs, um, not easily done in many circumstances and it can be costly to them of course. Now at the meeting we had um, between Nominate's uh, Policy Advisory Board and uh, the banks, discussion focused on a range of possible measures, I hope that wasn't anything too important. Um, that could be developed to address this issue. Um, and that ranged from memorandums of understanding that could be worked out at a general level um, to creating financial incentives by which the banks, who would get some return and some benefit, obviously, from a greater ability of the ISPs and registrars to cut off uh, fishers, that they would share some of that reward or that return with 
the ISP and registrar community. Um, and other things uh, that this enabled was for the registrars to start to add value to the services, not just be simply bodies that handed out domain names, but actually develop more of a value-adding service, both to their own customers and also, obviously, the banking community. So in that sense, it was a win-win situation that is beginning to be addressed through a focused partnership um, arrangement or a dialogue that Nominate has initiated. And I think the point that I really want to make here, and I will conclude with this, is that in many respects, I think if you can identify those partnerships that are a win-win situation for the partners involved, that they all get something out of it, then in this area anyway of e-crime, you start to address some of the issues that were raised this, at this morning's session on e-crime about the cost, the potential cost of challenging e-crime. And what I'm suggesting is when you see it at a general level, it seems so costly and it's such a massive problem. If you actually get it focused down to specific issues that specific partners can address together, the cost doesn't evaporate entirely, but it gets, or because there's a return for both partners, it actually is covered. And what the other point I'm wanting to make is that national registries and some of the community here can play a central role in doing that and promoting that best practice if they consider themselves more than just a body that distributes domain names. So I would leave that with you to think about and think about how in your country, because in each country the situation will be different from what it is in the UK, but if you can identify how you can play that proactive enabling role with the business community or other communities such as being talked about here by bringing the partners together, you will certainly be making yourself a central actor in making the internet a safer place. Thank you. Well, uh, we really want to get feedback. Uh, are we doing the right things in the United Kingdom? Should we be going further? Should we be having new categories? Uh, is the collaborative <coughs> process that we've started one that would make sense in your countries? Uh, who would like to make a first comment? There's a gentleman in the second row. We may need one microphone up here, so. Um, and we have development centers here in Hyderabad. This tool has been used to broadcast this session around the world, and uh, the screen that you see here uh, is that, and there are people joining in, listening, and hearing <coughs> what you're saying and they're asking us some questions and I'm just going to submit a couple of them to your review. Right. And this is being done in all workshop rooms and also in the main hall. So this particular question is from Mr. Kevin McCasley. He is in uh, New Hampshire, United States. Mm -hmm. It's pretty late night for him, but uh, he is part of the local county government over there and uh, he has some questions uh, which he hopes he can learn something from the panel and their experience and wisdom. So the two questions that he has are, um, what are the top three projects, according to all of you, uh, which are being uh, run or helped by the UK government uh, in joint partnership uh, with other entities, uh, maybe private bodies or otherwise? And what are the lessons that uh, you think are uh, transplantable from your experience in UK uh, to maybe a country like uh, United States or other countries that uh, are having a similar structure and things like that? Thank you. Well, um, Kevin, whatever time of night it is <laughs> for you, thank you for watching. Uh, that just shows the, the power of communications today. Uh, and also thank you for being generous in saying that is there something the United States could learn from the United Kingdom? We're, we're not averse to that sort of role play. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think I'm going to ask uh, Emily to just say what in her view are the top three projects that she'd list, and then I'll ask for other panelists to, <laughs> to volunteer to give some lessons. Emily. I think that um, in terms of the top, my top three, I'm looking at the context of what is supporting the international dialogue in the IGA. And it's becoming clear that you know, whilst we have you know, the best practice challenge, the crime and disorder reduction partnership, the work in the UK, combat child abuse images and the work that Andrew's highlighted um, 
so getting beyond the three, uh, to, to promote uh, uh, and celebrate the, the work of young children in adopting the internet. For me, what is becoming increasingly clear is that this UK IGF process is itself becoming a priority, is itself becoming a best practice, um, in that I hope it is inspiring others and we see that it has inspired others in different regions. We were hearing yesterday uh, from the East Africa uh, IGF project. And this moves on to the what are the lessons that could be transplantable into the US, but perhaps other countries. There are two that I'd like to highlight. And that is the value of national and regional processes. Because if the IGF is to succeed, we have to, and we want to get something out of it, we have to also put something into it. And what better way of doing this than to raise awareness at the national level and bring uh, concerns, agenda items, emerging issues that are relevant to your region, to your locality. And in this way, the best practice challenge perhaps might act as a model, because wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see best practice examples from all over the world, in developing countries as well as developed countries, and use them to inform and provide an evidence base for our policy dialogue as a snapshot as well for the way that the internet is being used and the creative responses that people are making to the challenges they perceive. Well there, Kevin, you've got the beginning of an answer. By the way, for those of you who are listening remotely around the world, uh, Nominet's website, <coughs> excuse me, Nominet's website is nominet, N-O-M-I-N-E-T, dot org dot UK. So uh, nominet dot org dot UK. Uh, Alan Michael, what particular lesson do you think you'd like to draw? Um, firstly, hi Kevin, uh, thank you for the question. You allow me to point out that we can learn from each other. Uh, it's a few weeks ago I was in the United States and Canada as a member of the Justice Select Committee because we were looking at ways in America new initiatives are being taken to cut crime and nip problems in the bud. So we, learning from each other is absolutely the heart uh, of everything we, uh, we do. Uh, as far as uh, dealing with crime on the internet is concerned, uh, I think the first principle of a crime reduction partnership has to be to undertake an audit and agree with people what things are already being taken care of, whether by industry or by uh, uh, law enforcement agencies, and not to interfere with what is being done successfully already. And secondly, to identify those areas uh, that uh, need joint action. Now, you can't actually do that. You can't identify the areas for action until you've undertaken the audit. And that is very much the area that we're working towards have not yet reached. But what we have agreed to do uh, is over the next few months to look at three particular simple areas uh, for focus, which if they had come out of the uh, audit as being priority areas, uh, what difference would the partnership make? Uh, and the three that we've identified are firstly, the vulnerability of older people going online, point that's been made earlier about the value, for instance, being able to be in contact with your grandchildren in a different uh, continent. The second one, bullying, and we focus specifically on bullying of teachers by pupils. And the third one, uh, the vulnerability of small businesses, uh, looking at businesses which are at the level that they don't have an IT expert or whatever. Um, so I, I think, Kevin, I can't tell you where we will have made a difference. I can just give those examples of where we've created a focus in order over the next few months to experiment with the partnership approach and see what difference we can make in, in, relation, in, in relation to internet-related crime and vulnerabilities. I am going to come to the floor, so people perhaps for her questions, but we were asked for different lessons. Uh, Andrew, quickly, would you like to say yeah. uh, something? Uh, I, I'll relate my answer to the presentation uh, I made. I mentioned uh, uh, e-skills, uh, the Sector Skills Council in, in the UK. That's www.e-skills.com, worth looking at. 
that's a, a government agency. One of its projects, it's in partnership with industry, it, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's driven uh, significantly by government. Uh, but one of its uh, projects is Computer Club for Girls. Some uh, 100,000 girls in 3,100 schools in 58% of state-funded um, uh, secondary schools and 17% of state-funded primary schools working on that project. The fascinating thing is, and it typifies the work that is done in the UK, I'd say eSkills uh, set up by government, significant industry input, there's a huge amount of partnership working, and that's in a sense typified by uh, the UK delegation here, representatives from the Parliament, representatives from the, uh, from, uh, the Department of Business, uh, and nominates, and of course uh, our friends from the CBI. There's a huge amount of partnership working in the UK, and that I think has to be encouraged. A quick word, Jeremy. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, just to support what has previously been said, I think it's, I will focus less on specific projects the UK government has and more on the role it has played in that it has facilitated and encouraged the partnership approach. I think it would be very uh, valuable if the incoming US administration took that approach too, and particularly internationally in relation to ICANN and other issues of fostering uh, partnership dialogue. Um, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Right, another question from the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rolof Meyer. I'm the CEO of SIDN, the Red Um My feedback is that I'm, I'm really impressed with um, what you have, re have realized through joint engagement. And I agree with Emily that um, the IDF process within the UK certainly has become a best practice itself. Something that's really worthwhile learning from for a registry as we are. And um, I've had some exchanges with Nominet on this already. And we are really going to try to, I'm sorry to admit, to copy some of the things you've been doing. And of course we're trying to do, do them even better, but meeting your level will be really something to well, will be quite a job, I think. But I think it's yeah something that Nominate is doing very well, and my compliments for that. In your country that we could learn from, that we're very keen to uh, collect evidence and information from elsewhere. While you're thinking, I didn't get Margaret in on uh, her lessons, um, and in case Kevin's still awake somewhere in New Hampshire, <laughs> uh, then perhaps I could ask Margaret just to comment on uh, her lesson. Uh, thank you. Um, Kevin, I hope we're not making you fall asleep with our contributions. Um, but uh, just briefly, actually, uh, in terms of lessons the US could learn on child uh, abuse online, uh, you're already learning them. Uh, in fact, this morning we had a meeting with your head of the Department of Commerce who told me that um, partly as a result of a session that we held when we went over to Washington to meet some of the senators, they are now uh, establishing something very similar to our multi-stakeholder uh, process involving uh, particularly all of the NGOs. Um, and I had the opportunity to bring together a wide range of those NGOs dealing with child protection issues uh, who themselves have concluded that they could no longer uh, have those discussions in isolation from government or in isolation from industry. So you are taking it forward. Of course, we have been very keen to ensure and engage with uh, your legislators, with your, with your NGOs in the US, because sadly, it is one of the countries from which uh, a lot of child abuse images, a huge number of child, uh, child abuse images originate in a separate independent body from government because uh, freedom was sacrosanct. However, he did want to ban gambling online, which he felt was a greater evil. Uh, so there is still a lot of discourse that needs to happen in the US, but I'm very pleased that following the discussion we had in Washington, dem talking about the model that we've dem demonstrated involving partnership, that now is being taken forward in the States. Thanks, Margaret. I mean, I think there's, there's a question there just while we're getting the microphone to you, um, th this key word banning, uh, I think anyone who's really s seen the way that the internet has, uh, know that banning something is a very blunt-edged sword. 
So what we're attempting to try to find is co collaborative ways of improving... Okay. Um, we're talking about collaboration and um, input from various stakeholders um, uh, for the future of the net and things. Um, maybe this is a radical suggestion or a radical question, but um, we, we talk about child protection and things, but how are children actually being included in, um, in, uh, uh, in the input? Um, is that already being done, or if it's not being done, what ways can that be done? Oh, a man, I to sleep. I have been saying for a very long time that as part of this partnership, both parents and children need to be involved. Um, it wasn't part of the original multi-stakeholder partnership. It, that is now being taken on board as part of the, the new arrangement, the, um, the new uh, agencies, the agency, the uh, UK Council for Child Internet Safety, uh, so that uh, children and young people and their parents can have a voice on the development of that child safety online strategy. Uh, I'll just mention a project that I developed personally uh, with um, a couple of NGOs a couple of years ago called Kids Speak. And I'm actually advocating that we, we walk the talk. In other words, we ensure that we listen to the voices of children and their experiences in order to inform our developing strategy by using the technology to hear their voices in a safe and anonymized way. Uh, so I'm pushing that door, and maybe with your help we can get there. Thank you. Sure. I mean, the, the, re the reason, just one comment, the reason that I say that is because um, most of us here uh, were born in times when there was no internet or we didn't have access to the internet. But um, a lot of um, children, uh, especially in Europe, who are now 15, 16 years old, um, haven't actually known a world without an internet. So in effect, we should be developing the net um, with them in mind as to what their requirements are. In, indeed, um, I'm surprised you started for teens because um, we go around schools as members of parliament and the very early stages are already online. Getting your feedback is very important. Alan. Um, yes, I just wanted to make a reference to the Byron Review. Um, Margaret's already referred to the work of Tanya Byron, who was appointed by the Prime Minister to uh, look at the vulnerability of children uh, in an online world. And uh, Tanya started very much from the right point, uh, in my view, firstly about children. Uh, the methodology involved a lot of listening to and talking to children and also to parents so that it was starting off with the experience of precisely the generation that you're uh, talking about. And she took it from a child development perspective in order then to come back to the issues uh, of how you protect children and how you deal with those vulnerabilities. So uh, just to endorse what, what Margaret says and the, the thrust of your question is absolutely right. Uh, if Bill Clinton didn't say it, but he might have done, uh, it's not the technology, it's the people, stupid. Uh, can I just add, first of all, in my constituency, practically, a little girl called Lily Dowell was murdered. And the parents wanted to do something to try to get rid of their own grief, but also to, to help others. Uh, and they did, with the help of uh, a network operator called O2, they did a very interesting survey to show themselves what it was that children wanted to do uh, to alert parents or friends. And they came up with the rather interesting fact that the one thing children are not keen to do is phone at home. It's a sort of psychological block. Uh, and, but they're happy to text. So Millie's fun was actually about encouraging children to understand and particularly parents to understand how texting works. And your point about generations the biggest effort was to make parents understand about texting, not the children. Uh, but if you're in trouble, texting home may well be the natural way that you would wish to alert somebody. Phoning home has got a blockage psychologically. Right, another question. Or but, uh, congratulations to the, to the panel for all that we've heard. And I think it's been a refreshing uh, contrast to some of the huge sort of top-down issues we've been hearing in the uh, main tent. I mean, uh, my suggestion is, I mean, uh, this IGF, I, I'm new to the IGF, but this IGF, I guess, has 
three or four main themes. Um, still on? Yes. Uh, for the IGF 2009, could we have one of the main themes organized by local and regional IGFs to bring out this sort of issue and really have it as a focus? Because I think it's a very useful contrast to the IP version 4 versus to IP version 6 or ICANN's big issues. This really is practical stuff that really will make the world better. And I think, I think it can do with promotion to a major theme. Well, thanks very much for